Friday YouTube. Welcome to another episode in this master study series. So we will be continuing this Rembrandt uh, self-portrait, this Rembrandt master study. So last week we went over the uh, buildup of the impasto texture. So if you haven't seen last week's video, uh, feel free to check that one out. And the one before that was about the uh, umber drawing or sometimes referred to as the umber layer or umbra layer in this process. So in this week's episode, we are going to start to draw a little bit more and introduce color. And I will be introducing a different uh, color palette, one that I really enjoy using and one that I've been using for quite a number of paintings now. All right, so for the color palette, we have titanium white. This is just a Winsor Newton titanium white. We have lead white from Williamsburg. We have, uh, well, lead white, also known as flake white from Williamsburg. We have Gamboge Lake Extra, which is a very nice transparent yellow from Old Holland. We have a yellow ochre deep. This is another Old Holland. We have w cadmium uh, red vermilion, excuse me, cadmium red vermilion. This is a Williamsburg color. Let me change brushes for this now. We have a um, alizarin crimson lake extra. This is a very nice deep, uh, very light, fast, deep alizarin, high quality alizarin uh, lake color. So I know that most people are using the alizarin permanent, but this is from Old Holland, and I'm not quite as concerned about the um, you know how it, people are saying that the uh, alizarin crimson uh, will fade over the years. The light and fastness of the alizarin crimson lake extra from Old Holland I trust very, very much. We have raw umber. This is Winsor Newton. We have ivory black from Williamsburg. And we have ultramarine blue. This is Williamsburg brand. And to the right, um, we have, in this little cup here, we have uh, turpentine. This cup here, we have spike lavender oil. Uh, I will be using the spike lavender for today. It uh, doesn't thin the paint out quite as much as the turpentine, and it certainly doesn't thin the paint out quite as much as, say, odorless mineral spirits would. Now, the photo reference for this Rembrandt master study that we're working on will be uh, given to you in a link in the description box down below. In the description box down below, you'll also have uh, Amazon affiliate links to the materials that I use, including the oil paints and this panel. I must say that this panel is my favorite type of panel to use. None of this is uh, paid sponsorship, by the way, but uh, this is the Ampersand Gesso Board Museum Series. Uh, not the smooth finish, but the... Uh, uh, the the museum series the uh, it's an archival uh, birchwood I think they um, market it as a birchwood but after trying so many different surfaces uh, I will say if you're trying to create a highly finished painting or a painting or especially a portrait that you're trying to finish either stick with an oil primed fine grain fine uh, textured oil primed linen or work on a wooden panel. Those are the two options that I would say. Uh, you can also work on a uh, aluminum panel or a copper panel or any other type of smooth panel. Uh, but this ampersand is my, my favorite type of panel to work on. And I recommend working on uh, this versus a cotton canvas, which is what I've been using for centuries, it seems, but it's only been a century and a year. But anyway, um, I would recommend doing this on either this surface or the oil primed linen and not on a cotton canvas. Now you will notice that I don't have an extra medium yet. I don't have a, uh, a Neo McGill out here. I don't have a uh, stand oil mix. I don't have a uh, liquid in here or, or anything like that. Uh, so what I'm recommending is with mediums, either mix them directly into your paint um, in anticipation before the painting session uh, or just don't use them at all if you are in your earlier stages of development in your painting which we are currently so there's no extra medium mixed into the palette this is uh, by the way my uh, current studio palette and I'll just be using this more often because uh, for me I find that it's better to leave the paint onto the surface and let it 
stamp itself kind of onto the wooden palette so you know exactly where the paint is so you don't have to kind of like where's this color where's that color so it's a little bit easier to have that um, laid out and uh, permanent for you to to know now uh, with the colors when you start to develop color I would recommend that um, using a palette knife to establish the uh, first blush tone and you're going to want to blur your eyes at the model or in this case we're blurring our eyes at the Rembrandt. Now I could have yellowed a lot over time but I see it a lot closer to the yellow orangey. Blush tones are typically towards the orange or towards the the pink in general and then you just neutralize those colors. So I'm starting off with the cadmium red vermilion which by the way again link in the description box down below. If you have never used a cadmium red vermilion or any vermilion type of color for flesh tone um, I would be interested in using a genuine vermilion but that's of course mercury based but in any case uh, if you haven't used any kind of vermilion it is a really nice color to use over say a cadmium red light or cadmium red medium so we have a very simple combination going on here at the moment we have the uh, cadmium red vermilion the yellow ochre and the uh, flake white uh, so just those three right now with the palette knife and I want to put out enough paint here because I'm going to create individual uh, different shades of value for the flesh color. So I'm perceiving the, the Rembrandt at least for the first layer I'm going to work not as chromatic so I'm actually going to jump in with the titanium white. The difference between the titanium white and the flake white uh, is that titanium white will raise the value much faster uh, with less paint so there you go now that the value is becoming much brighter and i want to tint this a little more towards the yellow um, so i'm going to use the gamboge like extra the gamboge like extra took me a while to get used to but it's a very nice uh, tinting color it's a nice uh, yellowish type of color so now I'm getting closer and closer to where I want to be with the flesh tone so now what I'm gonna do uh, leave that aside for now clean this palette knife I'm going to create a gray uh, not using black and white but raw umber and titanium white so raw umber and titanium white will create a nice little gray that's a little warmer so I want to have a gray just to neutralize the color once in a while and I will mix a little bit of the flake white just to have a little more heavy body into the paint mixture and once you see these colors mixed up on the palette you really won't see much footage of the palette I may show some footage of the palette once in a while uh, but we want to be a little more organized now with our mixture so without any extra color I'm just going to use what I have on the palette knife right now test it out see what it looks like with the flesh tone now the difference between high quality oil paints and uh, other oil paints is the thickness of the paint so let's let's get this closer to the um, closer to the camera here so you can see the well once I can get it to focus if I can even get it to focus technical difficulties where's my camera crew camera crew just kidding I don't have a camera crew well anyway I can't really get this thing to focus but uh, just you'll have to take my word for it and by the way I don't have a camera crew uh, it's just me um, the, the higher quality oil paint is much thicker uh, you don't have too much of that uh, oiliness I do have a little bit of the oiliness in this one and in this one and I'm going to replace them relatively soon these are uh, Winsor Newton colors and I can tell the difference pretty much right away and the consistency of the color uh, versus the old Holland and versus the Williamsburg so I know that it's been going on about five minutes now with the colors and you're probably like get on with it get on with it so I'm gonna move a little faster I just want this orange to be a little less saturated and that should be about good so for a middle blush color I'm gonna take what's already on this and I'm gonna create a different shade of it using the flake white a little more flake white and then I'm gonna use what's on this 
to create a different shade using the titanium white. Clearly you can see the difference with the titanium white. It's going to be much lighter. This gray can also help me out with the light of the eye known as the sclera in most cases, but I may not use it too much. I'm going to tint the light a little bit brighter. Now I'm looking at the highlight on Rembrandt's uh, forehead. I'm making it a little bit more yellow, yellow orangey. In general, uh, you don't have to nail the color perfectly uh, the first time you do this because it, we're going to be building up this painting. So now I'm using cadmium red and the raw umber, which I can tell the difference right away uh, with the uh, Winsor Newton raw umber consistency. It's just a little more oily than the cadmium red vermilion from Old Holland and the ivory black also has a different consistency, which of course I prefer the Williamsburg over the uh, Winsor Newton. So I'm making a nice kind of brownish color. What I want is to make sure that each one of these value jumps uh, somewhat coincides with one another. Now I will be, um, I will be uh, tinting these colors whenever I need them to be lighter or darker. Uh, I will be changing the, uh, the, the hue a little bit. I might make one area more reddish for the lips. Uh, more pinkish for the cheeks or something like that. But what you want to establish, especially in the beginning, I know this seems like a long process, uh, but what you want to do is establish a sense of unity within your flesh tones. You don't want to be jumping around uh, too much unless that's the look that you're going after. Uh, with your flesh tones, it may get sporadic and extremely confusing uh, if you jump around. I'm certainly guilty of doing that with a lot of my painting videos in the past. Um, in the past, I would introduce what I would call the color value web, uh, which is essentially what we're doing, but this is a much more controlled version of that uh, where we have, you know, we can observe the color value uh, chroma saturation jump between each area and we get to know the paint. I'm looking at the half tones on, on Rembrandt's cheek. Now, these are guesstimations. Again, I'm going to be modifying these colors as I go, but it is very important to have this here. And usually when I'm uh, working uh, in the, say I start a portrait in the morning, like right now, I'm starting a portrait, or I'm starting the colors in the morning. Uh, I will just take these colors, modify them for another portrait, another set of flesh tones so that none of it goes to waste, or overnight, um, since these will dry a little bit faster, since they're less oily, um, I'll just combine them all together and put all of those paints on the side of the palette there. Sorry for the autofocus. Let me change the autofocus now. As I said, I don't have a camera crew. And uh, we'll get this done before 10 minutes is up. But I'm definitely going to title this uh, video now something to do with um, more flesh tone mixtures because we're spending a long time with that. And then a lizard. Crimson Lake Extra with the Ivory Black. And then we'll just use the colors from here. Now after spending an eternity mixing those flesh tones, now we're going to finally get to paint. Uh, and let's talk about fat over lean because that's an important concept and I'll continue to keep talking about it. Essentially, what it means is that you don't want the uh, layers that you add. You don't want to add oil paint on top of uh, oil paint that is not completely dry yet. So uh, traditionally fat overlaying means that you don't want to uh, add medium too early. You want to have medium used in the later stages of your oil paint and again that's why uh, I'm not using any extra medium and I'll just be using spike lavender to thin out the paint whenever I need to thin out the paint. So we are going to be building the color. We are going to be um, of course drawing a little bit so here's my lightest light and now I'm going to change the change to the uh, kind of warmer color and we're not going to be painting quite as thick uh, anymore as we did with the impasto layer and I'm kind of testing 
the color right now. So I'm testing it to see if I'm going to be needing to make any kind of drastic changes. The only change I see that I need to make right now is in the light sensitivity in the camera. Uh, let's change it to there. I think that's a little more clear for this little section. I like to start with the forehead. Uh, typically the forehead is a good kind of warm up area, uh, so to speak. So I'm painting um, wet onto a dry oil paint now now that's a little too I want to say that's a little too uh, saturated so I'll go in with the gray and just mix right in with the gray now the texture of the layer underneath will show through which is something that I quite like now I'm gonna go a little bit darker as you see I'm just taking right from those flesh tone mixtures the idea with each layer is you want to have a strategy. You want to have a strategy uh, in anticipation of the finish. So I know that trying to go and finish each area uh, perfectly right now is just not a good idea for me um, at this stage. What I want to do is build the volumes of the uh, face, build the volumes. I think today we're just going to stick with this. Uh, this week we're just going to stick with this. Uh, we're going to build the volumes and make the drawing um, a little bit more specific. Keep the color not as bright. We're going to keep it a little less uh, a little less bright, so a little less um, saturated. So that's why I'm introducing a little more of the grays. And I recommend using the link that I showed uh, I showed you, or just look it up, the um, the Google Arts and Culture image for this Rembrandt, rather than I guess a regular photograph of this uh, Rembrandt, because with the Google Arts and Culture image, you can really see uh, all of the details. The coloring is really nice. And I'm just working from an iPad screen. You can also print this out. Just know that when you print it out, you add another distortion to the colors. Uh, when you photograph a painting, you already distort the colors. And then when you print it out, you distort it again. One could argue that the iPad screen or the computer screen also adds another bit of distortion. But you just you don't want to add the, the variation of now having to have a high quality printer. Uh, if you don't have one. So that's why I use the iPad screen. So I'm picturing the volumes as I'm uh, working in this way. And again, this is a good warm up because this is actually not that difficult. Uh, it's kind of like a sphere. It's like an elongated sphere. Uh, so I'll address some other questions that I've seen on the, uh, the comments. So about the distilled turpentine versus the gum spirits turpentine. Uh, from what I've been reading um, and listening to on other YouTube channels, I would check out the uh, Streamline Art channel on YouTube. Uh, I'm sure you've already heard of it, but um, there's one of th one one guy that does. Uh, another Rembrandt and he talks about uh, using a turpentine or using a um, using a uh, a spike lavender and then you find other people that use the turpentine like Nelson Shanks uh, used the turpentine it took me forever to <laughs> to break the laziness away and actually look it up and see okay what are the key differences and I would I recommend you do your own research and of course there's a certain level of toxicity with the turpentine and stuff you don't want to eat it um, you know with the uh, the lead white the flake white you don't want to use it as a face lotion as, as long as you're taking the you're taking precautions uh, of course I'm not going to be putting my hands into the paint as much with the flake white it's not all that bad just have a fan around you and you really want to consider the quality of the paint 
the quality of your oil painting. And so you're going to want to use materials that are historically proven and that are, you know, stuff that will stand the test of time. Uh, mineral spirits, I hear, uh, will, it has a not so good reputation with the oil painting film. So I'm a little more tentative about mineral spirits now these days uh, versus using spike lavender, which has a very rich history with oil painting and I, I hear is less toxic, but that's not why I use it. Uh, I use spike lavender because it, it thins the paint out nicely, but not as much as um, the turpentine or the OMS. And the... Um, the Spike Lavender also has a really pleasant smell, so I enjoy the the kind of spa-like uh, smell that you get in the studio when you use Spike Lavender. And again, I'm just looking at these planes and sculpting out. It's very relaxed. You don't want to rush to a finish in any stage. You want to know the objectives in each stage of your process and each painting that you create following your process, uh, you, it becomes more and more intuitive and you also learn more about, you know, what will make a difference uh, in these layers. For me, uh, recently I found that it actually helps to draw a little bit more in this stage. So now I'm going to start to put some of these little creases. And after uh, after long I will actually stand back and squint. Um, even though we're working from a photo reference you want to stand back and squint quite often. Now as I start to focus a little bit more, I won't speak as much, which I'm sure you'll enjoy. Uh, I should make a note that I haven't had to thin out the paint quite as much, and nor have I talked, have spoken too much about the brushes. Um, I'm not particularly uh, specific with which brushes I'm using. Uh, these brush, this brush that I'm using, using was actually uh, uh, given to me for a, a video that I did a little while ago, uh, a sponsored video for uh, an acrylic paint set, and I just found that the brushes are, you know, really nice to use for oil painting. But in particular, I mean, I mean, let's be uh, honest and transparent. This is from Michaels. This brush probably cost me about three dollars with the 20% off all of your items in your shopping cart sale. So yeah, um, I'm not that um, particular with the brushes. I may get to be more particular with the brushes in the future. I just haven't really had the chance to try um, more expensive brushes. But I'm adding paint on one section at a time. So synthetics are pretty useful for that. If I was to be uh, adding tons of paint all at once, uh, like the uh, Alla Prima approach, then I might want to use some uh, bristle brushes. In that case, I do have a preference, which is Robert Simmons. Now clearly there's a little too much of the yellow, so maybe what I'll do is um, once it dries I'll go in with uh, brighter pink, more opaque pink, or I'll just put that in later on today. But I'm not entirely worried just yet. 
I will be putting some more of the gray into my paint mixtures. There, now we're kind of neutralizing that. And gray is a wonderful color to have. Gray is a great color to have uh, for flesh tones on your palette. Chroma is a very important thing to think about. Uh, just because you, you want to think about the, the physics behind uh, the colors that you paint, you also want to think about the, uh, the Munsell uh, color, color system where you have the three components, hue, value, chroma. Uh, and typically you're going to have the most chroma um, in the brightest lights, but flesh tone in particular is just not going to be as chromatic. Even if you have really bright halogen lights and things like that, flesh tone will usually never get to be as bright as like an, a stop sign in the sunlight. Um, it just it just won't, and it'll look a little unnatural. But if that's the look you're going after, then that's the look you're going after, then that's okay. So we're going on about 12 minutes, 45 seconds on this clip, and I think I'll just keep the camera rolling. And um, with these uploads, I'm trying to slow the process down. I'm trying to slow it down, introduce techniques that produce higher quality results. And I'm also trying to put in more painting footage because this Rembrandt is also an extracurricular activity for my online painting students. Uh, so my online painting students, uh, aside from the projects that I give them and the lessons that I upload every week, I also um, give them the chance to send me images every Saturday night for our virtual classroom, our weekly virtual classroom, which is a video uh, where I use an app, a drawing app, to uh, give them instructions and critique, uh, do constructive critiques of their artwork and feedback on any questions and concerns that my students may have. So I'm also very uh, trying to be as considerate for my students as possible because I know that they will be uh, using this footage alongside the project, the main painting project. And for the, for the rest of you, uh, now if you are interested in taking online classes with me, just check out uh, patreon.com slash upariartist or go to the description box down below. I'll have a link for that. And you can also just have this video playing on the side while you're painting, maybe doing some chores around the house. Now, I, what I want to emphasize with the um, flesh tones, in particular with this episode, a little different to my previous episodes, is in the beginning, I gave you instructions on how to mix specific colors um, and how to organize those colors. And it's very easy, I find, at least for me, to get confused um, with what colors you're using and watch and excuse me, which area. So you want to keep those mixtures simple, um, and it's easier to keep that simplicity with a palette knife when you're mixing with a palette knife and you're just taking with the brush, and just use the brush to tint uh, the value of the color or to change the saturation a little bit, but nothing too complicated with these colors. Now, I'm not marketing this as uh, the secrets to Rembrandt or how Rembrandt painted because I don't know how Rembrandt painted. This is just uh, a classical approach that I've been uh, creating throughout the throughout the years.
And what I have is a group of paintings. I may work on three or four different paintings a day. And I won't work for that long on each painting. But it does help to have a process that, you know, it's, it's concrete. I know what stage I'm in. I know what I'm looking for. It gives me much more ability to troubleshoot mistakes. Once I identify a mistake, then I can clearly figure out why that mistake had taken place. And I'm using that grayish color that I mixed up before with a little bit of the um, raw umber. And um, brushes that are a little more stiff and used up. This one I let the color dry a little bit too much so I ended up chopping off uh, the part that dried. So I just use it to subtract or to spread paint. Right now I'm just using it to subtract a little bit of paint. Now I'm still not going to get too far into the shadows. So we're going to be building up in the lights. And you, you can uh, hopefully already see the transparent, not transparent, but the uh, kind of the luminous uh, quality of the Williamsburg and the old Holland colors. Like a section like that, that's a brilliant um, color, I think, with the vermilion. And we know, well, from a conservationist standpoint, uh, we know that Rembrandt used a vermilion. I can honestly tell you there's nothing more relaxing uh, than this, at least for me. And uh, mind you, I haven't had the need to thin out the paint quite as much, but we're already approaching the 20 minute mark in this painting clip. So I'm gonna go ahead and take a short break now. All right, so I've taken a short little break and now I've come back. Uh, I wanna mention that I don't think Rembrandt did this. Uh, just looking at the um, at the very, very close-up images of the, um, the Google Arts and Culture image. Uh, I can kind of see, or I guess, I guess we can all see when we look at the actual Rembrandt. If you look at corners, uh, now you have to look at the image on your own because you won't be able to see it in the little picture that you have over there. So if you look over here in the Rembrandt, let's walk our way over here now with the painting. And then I'll, I'll talk about what I'm seeing on the actual Rembrandt. Check this out. So now that I've covered this area, it does look very similar to the color, um, at least uh, relative to my screen, of the Rembrandt. But it seems like um, yeah, I'm seeing this color all throughout. Um, little spots over here and uh, 
Now, certainly seeing it uh, back here, which I don't see in, in mine, and I think that's the tone of the canvas, uh, which I heard uh, the uh, heard is called the uh, Im imprimatura or toning of the canvas. I suspect um, that Rembrandt may have drawn out the color, or sorry, drawn out first with the umber. Maybe he toned it in the imprimatura, he toned the canvas, and then I suspect he drew directly with the uh, the umber color. As we know, they had a lot of the, uh, they used a lot of the raw umber color, at least I hear that they used a lot of the raw umber color back then. I suspect that Rembrandt must have just went right into flesh tone for his underpainting, for his underlayer and built his embostos uh, with a kind of a monochromatic-ish uh, flesh color and then added variations later. So what that means is Rembrandt might have done something like what I did earlier, uh, mixing up those flesh colors, but he would have of course had a much thicker consistency lead white and um, just went in value uh, for value and draw over uh, what I suspect is uh, he must have had a much more refined umber drawing whereas mine was more generalized so I'm working more general to specific but I have a feeling that he went specific a little sooner I suspect I don't know. A lot of people will say that Rembrandt would have started with a Grisai. Go ahead and comment down below if you have information on this. Or if you have, um, I, I've been looking up a lot of art conservationist lectures on YouTube and looking up uh, articles, art conservationist articles. Because if you really want to learn about the uh, old master techniques, the old master, uh, how they worked, you definitely want to look up uh, art conservationist articles. It was in that uh, one article that I saw that Rembrandt also had some chalk in the paint that he used. Uh, I guess he might have used chalk uh, in grinding up the pigments or in the pigments or something. And um, also I, I heard that there was some pine resin found in, um, in the layers. Pine resin, I guess, would hint at... Uh, uh, turpentine so you definitely want to be as uh, learned as possible with the uh, material science Uh, and I also read that in, um, uh, well, you have to look up the conservationist videos, but I also uh, read a lot about um, how, how Rembrandt, Rembrandt students in particular uh, would, would uh, do this copies, the copies of Rembrandt paintings, but if you look at one particular uh, study that's been been done. If you look up Rembrandt uh, art conservationist talk on YouTube, it will be a, about the first or the second video uh, where they examined X-rays of Rembrandt's, and those are pretty awesome to see the X-rays and seeing the um, the uh, under layers of the Rembrandt's is is quite exhilarating. But you see that they compare some of the student works, uh, student master studies to the original Rembrandts and in some cases there was one Rembrandt in particular that was one painting that was contributed to Rembrandt for a long time that then they, they then changed to uh, to be a, one of his students copies but it looked so close to the Rembrandt but it was only when they examined earlier or they examined uh, the x-rays they found that the image had um, a uh, outline 
So it, it was an outline transfer, which they say, the conservationists say that Rembrandt didn't do, which I find to be quite exciting just to learn any little bit of information that I can about Rembrandt or any of these masters. I think from Rembrandt, I might, I'm not sure yet, but I might move to Velasquez. And maybe we'll move into Vermeer. Oh, we're definitely going to keep it old school. But I'll be sticking with uh, classical, most likely classical uh, Baroque uh, painters. Or Baroque style, or Dutch painters. As we know, Vermeer and Rembrandt are Dutch. I find this uh, this uh, era of painting, uh, not this painting, but the the uh, actual Rembrandt, to be one of the, uh, the I don't know how to describe, but the uh, most uh, what's the word here? Cap most captivating eras in all of painting in terms of technique. And you hear a lot of artists talk about, um, you know, if you look at a Nelson Shanks video, uh, if you look at his, uh, if you just type up Nelson Shanks, again, he's one of my favorite, uh, favorite artists of all time, who recently passed away in 2015, unfortunately. Uh, but he attributed his initial motivation to painting, be, uh, being from looking at a Rembrandt painting of uh, Rembrandt, painting of his son. Rembrandt painted uh, his son Titus. You, look, you listen to a lot of other artists and they will cite Rembrandt as their initial, the, the spark that ignited their interest in painting. And for me it was uh, for the most part uh, Vigi Lebrun, a portrait I saw in the uh, Baltimore Museum of Art. Um, attributed to Vigi Lebrun. That was my, that was my like, wow, I really want to learn how to do this moment. But Rembrandt has inspired so many throughout the ages. So if that's the case, we've got to figure out what kind of techniques he would have used. And already I'm seeing the the lead white or the the flake white having a great impact in the uh, quality of the paint, the textures of the paint. to raise the uh, the uh, underplane of the wing of the nose a little bit here. Oof, that's way too red. So let's use the gray and raw umber. A little better, but let's get let's get that little uh, scraper brush. kind of mush it. And I, I usually dry clean that brush as I dry clean the, um, the uh, fan brush that I'll use. And now is the time where I would probably uh, use the spike lavender 
to clean the brush. Rather than thin the paint, I would use it to clean the brush. Now the last time I did uh, a Rembrandt, I got yelled at pretty bad about using synthetic brushes. So I'm probably going to get yelled at again um, in the comments of this video. But the, uh, the objective, again, is not to paint exactly like Rembrandt. Because I don't know exactly how he painted, I can only speculate. But to use um, modern materials to emulate the uh, the way that his painting looks. And the purpose here is to provide you with this footage to help you in your own painting development, your own painting journey or just to inform you on painting, even if you're not a painter. But I'm telling you, this is a lifelong, lifelong journey. I've been painting for 11 years now. I'm still learning things every day. That little bit of resistance in the paint drag um, is a, a, a quality or a trait, a, a characteristic of the higher quality paints and the, uh, the flake white. You know, you can really feel the, uh, the thickness of the paint with these old Hollands and Williamsburg. Now I'm just going in plane by plane. I can't specifically describe each plane to you. That's why I'm talking about other things or um, just remaining quiet. It's because I'm not a robot. I'm not physically going in here and saying, you know, this is the top corner of the um, the orbicularis oris. I'm not. I'm not saying to myself, there's the side plane of the cheekbone, the zygomatic bone as it wraps underneath towards the mandible. I, I don't think in those terms, to be honest. I think um, in terms of shape and value. Not so much color right now. I'm emphasizing shape and value. Now before too long, we're definitely going to have to go into these uh, kind of reddish tones in the shadows. And I can see that's a wonderful usage of vermilion that Rembrandt has there. You can see the similarities in the color. Oh yes, vermilion is a wonderful thing. Even though this is a cadmium red vermilion. Have any of you tried the Old Holland uh, version of the genuine vermilion? It's an extremely expensive color, but I'm curious now about that.
Although the, uh, I'm quite infatuated with the Williamsburg uh, Vermilion, Cadmium Red Vermilion. Another thing is you really want to know the drying time with your paints. Um, so I do mix in the Alkid oil paints, the fast drying paints. Um, so if I want my paint to dry overnight, I'll mix in a lot of the um, Alkid, uh, which is from uh, Winsor Newton for the uh, preliminary layers. Like the this impasto layer was done with the uh, Winsor Newton uh, titanium white alkyd fast dryer. I also read um, that they make an underpainting white. So thank you. Uh, if you're watching this and you wrote that in the comments. I'll definitely have to check in on that. But now that again we're getting into color you can see the uh, the, the luminosity of these colors, it's wonderful, I think. Hopefully it shows up in the screen. It's a bit too red, so I'm going to go for the raw umber and the uh, gray that I mixed up. Now we're going to add a bit more of a pinkish hue up here. Way too bright. I also heard that Rembrandt, um, back back in those days, they, they only had uh, round brushes, which is interesting. I mean, I'm using a little flat brush. It's also an interesting thing to take note. Now we've just passed the 20 minute mark in this little interval, so I'm going to take another break. Alrighty, so I'm back now, after taking a short little break. I think this 20 minute segment may be the last. Uh, I think we've done two other 20 minute segments, so we may have to split up the footage depending on how things go with the editing. I'm trying to provide you with as much uh, free content as I possibly can here on YouTube uh, of the painting footage. And again, using a technique that I, I believe produces really good results.
But again, if you would like to take online classes with me at only $10 a month where you get to have uh, video feedback every week in the virtual classroom, as well as uh, uh, projects that I guide you through from start to finish. The project that we've been working on in my class, we're working on, we're going on to the eighth video, so that means that they have roughly around eight hours of footage, if not maybe a little bit more, on their project, which we'll be finishing soon, then moving on to another project. Uh, again, new students, you can start off with lesson one. We're on lesson eight now, but you can, you know, even in the future when I'm on lesson 400 or lesson 100, you can always send me images of lesson one. Uh, the online classes are results-based classes, so I guide you through every stage and ensure that you have uh, the highest quality uh, painting that you can possibly get. And that is, again, um, as of right now, $10 a month. But of course, all of this footage that you're getting here is for free. Now I can really see the layering in the Rembrandt. I can see that this is a layer painted over top of another layer in the uh, individual Rembrandt. I think the colors are fairly close, um, but I don't know. It could be my iPad screen, or it could be since I'm painting early in the morning. I'm not really as uh, focused. I don't know, but it does seem like the colors are kind of similar to the Rembrandt. A little bit more similar than my previous uh, videos on Rembrandt. But again, the goal with this master series is to uh, provide you painting footage following a very uh, consistent process And the goal is to, again, uh, be able to create an uh, online student body, a community uh, where we are learning this process together. Where the students are learning that process. In the past, I would um, make the videos uh, vary in terms of technique from one week to another. Um, that's pretty much how I painted for a long time. Um, and this approach isn't, isn't anything new. I've used approaches like this before, uh, just not with the higher quality paints. But I made the decision after so many paintings that, that, that this this approach produces the uh, higher quality results.
So now I'm putting in a little bit of that darker half tone that we mixed before. Uh, a little note on edges, <clears throat> excuse me. You don't want to have sharp edges everywhere, but you do want to pay attention to where the sharpest edge lives, and I think it's around here. Now these videos are intended to be for anyone that really wants to take their time to view each episode, draw along with me, paint along with me, and um, and if you are interested in further education, checking out the online classes. So we're going to have to put some of those uh, lights now in the shadow. Those uh, vermilion type colors. And again, refer to the earlier section of this video for the color mixtures, because all I'm doing is just adding a little bit of cadmium red vermilion into the darker, the darker half tone that we mixed up. And raw umber I use to bring down the intensity a little bit. I'm going to switch to another brush now. Raw umber into the gray. 
that we had before. We usually use a little bit of flesh tone, but not this time. Some little traces of the sclera. So now I'm going to have to thin out the paint a little bit and perhaps use a different brush. I'm going to use that um, mixture that I had before, the um, Ivory Black and the Alizarin. Uh, have I been saying Alizarin permanent? Hopefully. I'm probably going to get the colors mixed up, but again, I mentioned them earlier. The uh, a lizard and crimson like extra. I'm gonna try not using any of the spike lavender yet. Let's see if it's thin enough, which it kind of is. You have to anticipate that these darker colors will sink in a little bit uh, after the painting dries, and that's okay. Meaning it's not such a problem if it looks very dark at this stage. Whoops. I'm going to bring the value up a little bit using those colors that we pre-mixed earlier. So one thing I'll do for the eyebrows, 
I'll uh, model around them or sculpt around them and then uh, sometimes paint them out and then add them back in wet on wet see that there's a little more width uh, for this shape here which may end up moving the eye a little bit to the left this one to the left which is not a problem We'll get back to that sclera color. And then that darker dark that we had before. And then we were able to move that eye a little bit. It may need to move again, but uh, in any case, we are now approaching the 20 minute mark. So that concludes three consecutive uh, 20 minute intervals. Uh, you have seen every brush stroke. I think that it's probably a little bit more useful to show you the video like this. And again, this is also geared towards my um, online students being able to use this footage, uh, paint along with me and send me images uh, for the uh, teacher slash student feedback every, uh, for every week. It is an optional thing that the students have for my online classes. Again, if you are interested in taking online classes with me, check out Upari, or, uh, sorry, check out patreon.com slash Upari artist or just go to the description box down below and I'll have a link to my Patreon, including the online classes. Remember that $10 a month. Next week, you will see the further development of these shapes as I continue to make them more and more refined. That being said, if you'd like to see more videos such as this one, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. I wish you the best in all of your artwork, and I'll see you on the next one. And it's now time for our new patron shoutouts. And so thank you, thank you so much, Emmanuel Doblin. And thank you, thank you so much, Aki. I hope I can pronounce your names properly. And uh, thank you so much for your support on my Patreon. It means so much to me. It means the world to me. I hope that you will enjoy the benefits that you have unlocked on my Patreon account. Remember, each week... I upload the behind the scenes episodes on Saturdays. For the online students, online mentorship tier, I upload a new lesson every Monday. I also upload the virtual classroom, including the teacher slash student feedback video. And 
Remember to send me images. You have the option to send me images for the teacher slash student feedback video, which I also call the virtual classroom, by Saturday night, 11.59 p.m. Remember to t take the lessons at your own pace, and always feel free to ask me for questions regarding any of the lessons. Again, thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you on the next one.